Praise the Lord. Well, Pastor Wayne threw stuff out this morning, so uh, I figured I ought to do that too. Anybody want a Tootsie Roll? Look at those adult hands go up. Wow, look at that. Here we go. Now, now you got to watch out in church. You know, you might get beamed with Tootsie Roll, okay? All right. Who wants a Tootsie Roll? I saw a hand right here. You want a Tootsie Roll? Okay. Praise the Lord. Hey, look at those hands go up. Man, I'm telling you. People are excited. Oh, okay. Former board member, I had to. Oh, pastor's wife. Here we go. You ready? Heads up. Okay. I heard my wife say, hey. There you go. Right over here? Okay. There you go. I see some kids there. All right. I got a big bag. Now, I don't want to hurt anybody. All right. Here we go. You ready, guys? Now, you got yours on Wednesday night, but here you go. All right. Now, please don't leave those on the floor because, you know, the people who clean the church will be very upset with me. Now, oh, I see Mark's hand in the back. Okay, Mark, I'll tell you what, buddy. I've got the deal of the century for you. I got a Tootsie Roll for you for a hundred bucks. No, no. hundred bucks for a Tootsie Roll. Do I have any takers? Get your checkbook out. No? You know, funny, I, I gave the same offer on Wednesday night and I didn't have any teenagers take me up on it either. And one of them got her credit card out like I was an ATM machine or something. She's waving her plastic at me, you know. I said, no, I'm sorry, I'm just cash or check only. Halloween is big business in America. Next slide. The uh, manufacturers of candy in America tell us that Halloween is their biggest business day of the year. And in fact, it's estimated that in this year they will sell over $2 billion worth of candy. Sorry, next slide. I'm going to read that in a second. My fault. $2 billion worth of candy. We'll go back to that slide in a second. Not only that... But the people who make the candy tell us, and I don't know where they get this step, but I'm sure they've done market research and that's why they sell a lot of candy. But they tell us that 93% of children in America who are of the trick-or-treating age will actually go trick-or-treating. Ages 5 to 13, 93% will go trick-or-treating this year. And that makes, that altogether makes Halloween the Second largest commercial holiday in America, second only to Christmas. It's estimated that $6.9 billion annually are spent in this country on Halloween. Now, the question we want to ask tonight is, what's the big deal about Halloween? I sold my soul for a Tootsie Roll. What does that mean? Well, we're going to get to that in just a second. What's the big deal about Halloween? Well, before we go any further, we ought to read some scripture because we want to preach the word and not man's opinion tonight. Amen? If we can go back to slide number two there. Sorry to mess you up, Jeremy. We're going to read tonight from Deuteronomy chapter 18, beginning in verse 9. If you've got your Bible, you can read with me there. I'm going to read from the New King James. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 9. The Word of God says this. If you don't have it, it's up on the screen. When you come into the land which the Lord your God is giving you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or his daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens or sorcerers, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls up the dead. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord, and because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out before you. Let's pray. Let's say a quick prayer for Pastor Tim tonight. Can we do that? Heavenly Father, we ask you to visit Pastor Tim Davis right where he's at right now. Lord, I ask that you would heal his body and raise him up in Jesus' name. For Lord, I know that he'd rather be here tonight, and Lord, I'm thankful for this opportunity, but I pray for my brother that you would heal him tonight in Jesus' name. Now, also, Lord, I pray that you would quicken our hearts to hear this word. Lord, I pray that it would not just be some sort of a little Halloween seminar, God. I pray that our lives would be changed by the word of God. I ask it in Jesus' mighty name, and everyone said, Amen. Amen. What's the big deal about Halloween? Why is Halloween popular in our nation? I talked about this with the teenagers on Wednesday night. Why, why is Halloween popular in America, not only amongst teena- not only amongst children, but also amongst teenagers? And amongst adults, you know that Halloween is a popular holiday even with the people that you work with, isn't it? Amen? I went to Kroger today and the checkout lady had devil horns on. I watched a football game today and the cheerleaders are all dressed in Halloween costumes. They had little bitty girls dressed up in their cute little costumes with with their faces painted like skulls or whatever. Halloween is a big deal for everybody in America, isn't it? Why is it so popular? Well, there are a lot of things that make it popular, especially amongst the generation that I minister to, and maybe even many of you adults. One thing that's very popular in America, I don't know whether you realize this or not, but one thing that's very popular is horror movies. Do you know that the genre of horror movie is one of the most popular types of movies that there is in America today? Now, most of those movies are awful as far as quality. They always get terrible reviews. Every horror movie does. 
And yet they are the most popular. They make more money than many of the other movies that are made in America every year. This year is no exception. This year we've got lots of good ones coming out. Your teenager may be excited about going to see the movie Doom. It's got The Rock, the wrestler in it, right? Now, for the uninitiated or the uneducated, Doom is based on a video game of the same name. And if you don't know what that's all about, it's a first-person shooter type game. They call them FPS games, first-person shooter. Uh, uh, similar to games like Quake or uh, Wolfenstein 3D or the ubiquitous and ever-popular, I guarantee you, half this church plays it, Halo. Now, I've never played Halo, so I don't know that much about it. But I got a feeling it ain't rated M for mature for nothing. Moving on. That was for free. The Fog, a remake of a movie that was made in the 80s. The commercials scared me to death. My mom wouldn't let me watch horror movies, but they remade it. And then, of course, our good friend Jigsaw is back. As if Saw number one wasn't bad enough, we've got Saw number two this year for Halloween. I guarantee you that movie will make tons of money. Not only that, what makes Halloween popular? Well... Halloween is a time for pranks and mischief, right? All of you have had your house egged. That's a joy, isn't it? Don't you thank God for Halloween every year as you're scraping the egg yolk off your window, off your porch, off your car? Halloween is a time of mischief. Not only that, but Halloween is a time for costumes. You see a guy there dressed like a Tootsie Roll. I couldn't pass that up. Down there in the corner, you know, he's dressed up like a Tootsie Roll. I just, you know, it just fits. Costumes and parties and haunted houses. I, I subscribed to the Indianapolis Star. It seemed like every day I saw an article in there about a different haunted house. And there's a big picture there. And there's some dad and his little kid. You know, and the kid's like wrapped around dad's leg. You know, like. Aah. And dad looks just as scared. Haunted houses for charity. Haunted houses at churches. What else makes Halloween popular? Well, there's experimentation with the occult. With occultic practices, things like Ouija boards and tarot cards and stuff like that. Do you know that that goes on in Indiana? Do you know that it's big in Indiana? Did you know that? I walked into the BP right up here on the corner last night after we got back from, from a great Bible quiz meet up in Elkhart. I walked in there and there was a woman in there, very normal looking. She had on some sort of charm brace, bracelet on her wrist and I overheard her talking to the young man behind the counter and I don't exactly know how the conversation went but I... But he had done her some sort of favor and he said, I'll tell you what, I'll do this for you if you'll help me understand the tarot better. And here's this woman and she says, you know what, I got a book and it's kind of old, but don't worry about that, it'll help you. And I just, I, I got this really creepy feeling like I was standing in church listening to somebody say, you know what, I understand you're having some trouble in your life and you, you need to find out about spiritual things. So I got some books or some counseling and it'll help you. That's exactly how she was talking to this kid, talking about tarot cards. So what's the big deal about Halloween? Because some of you probably believe or may have thought before or do think tonight that Halloween is harmless. That it's just for fun. It's just pretend. You say, come on, Pastor Jeff, my kid likes to dress up like strawberry shortcake and she looks adorable. Well, I believe you. She goes to Grandma's house and gets her Tootsie Roll. What could possibly be wrong with that? Well, nothing if that were what Halloween is all about in America. But none of us believe that that's what it's all about. You see, all you have to do is drive down your street in your neighborhood to see what Halloween is all about. All you have to do is turn on your television this time of year to understand what Halloween is all about in America. All you have to do is open your door when the doorbell rings on Halloween night and see those little kids standing before you dressed in every possible co costume that you can imagine to understand what Halloween is about in America. Halloween is about costumes. It's about trick-or-treating. It's about candy. And I love candy. So don't get me wrong. Halloween is about jack-o'-lanterns and about decorations in the yard. I mean, I just it amazes me. We used to just decorate our yards for Christmas, but now you drive around on Halloween and you've got the great pumpkin on somebody's roof. But not only that, but Halloween is about death. You drive by these houses, they've got tombstones in the yard. They've got skulls, they've got skeletons, they've got, they've got ghosts and other things in their yard decorating their house. Halloween is all about death. Not only is it about that, but it's also about witchcraft about witches and black cats and spells and things like that. We've already mentioned that Halloween is about fear. It's about horror movies. It's about being scared. It's about telling ghost stories around the bonfire. It's about haunted houses that are big business here in America. Halloween is about the demonic. It's about evil spirits and the occult. And finally, Halloween, as Pastor has mentioned twice today, Halloween is about darkness. Do you know that everything that happens that anybody ever wants to be involved in, in on Halloween happens at night? Ain't nothing happening in the daytime. 
It all happens in the dark. So tonight I want us to understand what the big deal is about Halloween. And somebody said once that in order to understand a thing or to understand why things are the way they are, then you must first understand that thing's history. So it's not my intention to bore you tonight or to give you just a man's opinion, but I've done my research, I've done my homework. Because just like you, I get tired of preachers standing up and condemning a thing and not knowing what they're talking about. So I, I've done the research, I've done the work, and I want to share it with you so that you can be convinced that not only do I know what I'm talking about, but this thing is what we say it is, something that we shouldn't have anything to do with. So where does Halloween come from? And then we're going to talk about what the Bible has to say, the scripture that we just read, we're going to apply it. I want to talk to you first of all about the origin of Hall- Halloween. Halloween has, an, has as its origin a Celtic festival called Sohain. Sohain, I'm sorry, Sohain. Now I know it's spelled like Samhain there, but it's pronounced Sohain. And this is a Celtic festival that took place on October the 31st, and it dates all the way back to the time of Daniel the prophet, about 600 B.C. Now, by the way, I have nothing against Irish people, British people, or Celtic people. That's not what this message is about. This is just where it came from. Are you with me? Now, Sohain literally means the end of summer, but it can refer to one of two different things depending on what you read. It can either refer to the Feast of the Dead, the actual festival itself, which is what it was called. It was, the, it was the Feast of the Dead, a feast, a festival honoring the dead. Or it can also refer to the Celtic god of the dead himself. His name was Sowen. And it was celebrated on October the 31st. And October the 31st in this ancient Celtic cu- culture divided the two seasons of the Celtic year. And you know what they were? Light and dark. Two seasons. And October the 31st was the dividing line between the light season and the dark season. And so the Druids, who were the priests of this religion, they were witches is what they really were, but they were called Druids. And what they believed was that during this crucial time, this dividing line between the light season and the dark season, this twilight of the year, so to speak, they believed that the thin veil that separated the land of the living from the land of the dead, the land of the physical from the land of the spiritual was removed, and the spirits of the dead and the spiritual world merged with the physical world, and the spirits of the dead would roam the earth on this night. So this is where Halloween gets its association with death and with darkness. It originated with this festival of sowing and what the Druids taught the people. Now, speaking of spirits and Halloween, what do spirits have to do with it? Well, depending on what legend you read, you'll find out that on sowing they believed that the souls of the wicked dead were gathered up by sowing by the Lord of the dead. He would go and he would gather up all the souls of the wicked dead on this night and then he would, he would punish them for the deeds of their life. And in most of the things that I read, that punishment was carried out by reincarnating them in the form of some animal. This is why the people were very superstitious about evil-looking animals like black cats and owls and bats and things like that. They believed that these were reincarnated spirits of evil people. So the Lord of the dead would go about and he would gather up the souls of the wicked dead to uh, send them to their final destination, wherever that may be. Also, the legend says that the souls of the dead or also the evil spirits or the demonic spirits that they believed that existed, they would roam the earth on that night. And so because of that, people were very fearful. They were very afraid to go out at night on the night of sowing because they believed it was a night where the, land of, where the land of the living and the land of the dead merged together and they were afraid that they might be attacked or they might encounter an evil spirit on that night. So this is where Halloween gets its association with fear and with ghosts and with spirits and demonic things. This is where it comes from. Are we learning anything so far? Okay, I hope I'm not boring you. So as we continue to talk about Halloween, well, what, what's the deal with the costumes? And what about trick-or-treat and jack-o'-lanterns and things like that? What about all these seemingly innocent things that just about all of us maybe at one time in our life, maybe we participated in? I know when I was a kid, we had a pumpkin on the porch from time to time. So what's this all about? Where does it come from? Well, during this time, during, during this time when people celebrated this festival in this culture that I've been speaking about, in the Celtic culture, people would leave food on their doorsteps for the spirits that might happen to come by. They would leave that food just in case it was a spirit of one of their dead relatives in order to provide for them. Or if it was a wicked spirit or an evil spirit or a spirit of an evil dead person, they would leave that food there in hopes that it would appease them so that they would not come in and then do something bad to their home. You see, they believe that if you didn't appease the spirit, if you didn't leave something for them, then they would come to your house and they would either cast a spell or they would come in or they would do some sort of, they would do some sort of trick. They, they, would, they would perform some sort of evil. They'd put some sort of curse on your family. And so therefore that, you either gave them a treat or you got a trick. Trick or treat. 
people would take gourds and turnips and they would carve out uh, faces on them, faces that to them looked like evil spirits. They would carve them out. And they would take a candle or some other sort of light. I guess candles all they had back then, but they would put a light inside. They would put a candle inside. And they would set that on their doorstep. They would set that out in the front of their home in the hopes that, they, that it would scare away the evil spirits. Now, in the 1800s, this thing happened in Ireland called the potato famine. I don't know if you studied about that in school or know anything about that, but this potato famine happened in Ireland. And so as the Irish people immigrated in by the thousands to the United States during that time, they brought this custom with them. Well, when they got to America, they, uh, they realized there aren't a whole lot of turnips and gourds in America, but there sure are a whole lot of pumpkins. And they're a lot easier to carve. And they're bigger. And so that... Hence, that's how the whole carving of the pumpkin thing got started, and it stuck. Now, the jack-o'-lantern itself has an interesting story behind it. Do you know where the jack-o'-lantern comes from? Would you like to know? It comes from an old British legend about a man named Jack, oddly enough. And Jack was a drunk, essentially, a wicked man. And somehow, Jack played a trick on the devil. Now, I'm not sure exactly how that's possible, but that's what Jack did. He, he played a trick on the devil. Well, when Jack died, because he was a wicked man, because he was a drunk, he was not allowed admittance into heaven. But because he had played a trick on the devil, the devil didn't want him either. Yeah, that's real scriptural. But anyway, this is how the story goes. Man, I went to high school with a kid. He had a t-shirt. I'm not kidding. He had a t-shirt that said, heaven doesn't want me and hell's afraid I'm going to take over. The sad part, I don't know why I'm telling this, but the sad part of that story is that same kid was killed in an automobile accident three months later before he graduated. And that hit me like a ton of bricks. Because when I heard that he had died, I thought about that shirt and I thought, man, he found out that wasn't true. Heaven sure did want him. And hell wasn't afraid of him. That was for free. I don't know why I said that. But anyway, back to Jack. Couldn't get into heaven. Devil didn't want him either because he would played a trick on the devil. So he said, what am I supposed to do? Well, so the devil carved out a gourd, put a coal from the fires of hell inside of it and gave it to him. And now the spirit of Jack roams the earth for all eternity with only his jack-o'-lantern to guide the way. Think about that the next time you put your pumpkin on your porch. You're trying to condemn me, Pastor Jeff? No, not at all. I just want you to know where this stuff comes from. Before you carve out the pumpkin, put the candle inside and say, Oh, isn't that cute? You need to know where it comes from. During this time, people would dress up like ghosts, like evil spirits. Not to scare away the evil spirits. Now listen, this is very important. People would dress up like ghosts, like evil spirits in wicked costumes... Not to scare away the evil spirits, but to look like them. In the hopes that if they encountered an evil spirit, they would be mistaken for one of their own. So that they could just blend in. Now we don't do that today, do we? We don't try to look like the world so we can just kind of blend in to kind of avoid being harassed or persecuted by the enemy. See, what's wrong with a costume? Well, a costume is intended to hide your identity. And I'm afraid that we in the church, we've gotten used to wearing spiritual costumes so we can avoid persecution. You know, I'm a Christian. I'm a believer. I'm not really evil. I just want to sort of look like them so that they won't bug me, so that I won't. We're supposed to stick up, stand, up, stand up and stick out, aren't we? It's getting harder in America because we're getting more persecuted. But that's why people would wear the costumes. They wanted the evil spirits to leave them alone. They knew they couldn't scare them away. They were evil spirits. So they would dress up like them in the hopes that they would be mistaken for an evil spirit themselves. And this is where all the, this is where the trick-or-treating, the jack-o'-lanterns, the evil costumes, all that stuff come into play in Halloween. Now what about witchcraft? Why is witchcraft associated with Halloween? Well, the Druids believed that during the time of sowing, that that was the best time for divination. Because the barrier between the living and the dead was removed during this time, this was the easiest time for them to contact the dead, to conjure up the spirits of the dead. And through that, they would practice divination. People would come to the Druids to find out who they were supposed to marry, to find out whether they were going to have a good crop or a bad crop that year, to find out whether they were going to have good fortune or bad fortune. They would pronounce, you know, curses on people. Where Am I going to live? Am I going to die? What's going to happen to me? They would practice divination during this time. Now, there were lots of methods and rituals, and I can't go into all those, but there's one that you might find interesting that was associated with this sowing festival on October the 31st. I want to apologize to the young people because they've already heard this sermon, So, but that means you know all the good places to say amen, so help me out, all right? Now listen, one ritual that they used for divination, well, one, one legend that they had in the, in the Celtic religion, they had this legend about an island across the western sea called Avalon. 
All you Avalon fans, well, what? I don't know. I don't know why Avalon is called Avalon, but that's what this island was called. And Avalon was the island of the dead in the Celtic religion. And it would lie somewhere across the Western Sea. And supposedly on this mythical island of the dead, there was a tree that had magic apples on it. Now we know that every false religion in the world has at somewhere at its root a perversion of something true in the Word of God. Amen? And so you see in this legend a perversion of the tree of life that we will find in heaven. And the fruit that is on it will give us life everlasting. Amen? That's what the Bible tells us. But on this mythical tree on the island of Avalon, there were magic apples. And the heroes of old will supposedly sail across the Western Sea, heroes like King Arthur, to grab a magic apple. So you know what they would do? To commemorate the journey of the heroes across the sea to find the magic apple, they'd get a wooden tub and they'd fill it with water and they'd bob for apples. And after they got the apple, they'd use the apple in some sort of divination ritual. Now, obviously, we know that it's not a sin to eat an apple. That's not the point. But what did Paul say about food offered to idols? He said, if somebody offers you something to eat and doesn't say where it came from, then you say thank you and eat it, right? But if somebody offers you some food and says this was sacrificed to an idol, you ought to say no thank you. Because you don't want them to believe that by accepting that food, you somehow accept how they got it. Are you with me? Nothing wrong with eating an apple, Pastor Jeff. That's absolutely right. But we don't want to tell someone, you know what, I approve of the practices of Halloween. I approve of divination, which is where this comes from, by eating the apple that you told me came from bobbing for apples. Do you know that Halloween is, this is totally for free too. Do you know that Halloween would be an excellent opportunity for you parents to teach your kids something in this same vein? Your kids go to a friend's house and the friend says, hey, I've got some candy. You want a piece? Well, sure. Thank you very much. And even if that candy came from trick-or-treating, hey, that's fine. They gave thanks. No big deal. That's what Paul said, right? But what if your, little, your child's little friend says, hey, I went trick-or-treating the other night and I got some candy. You want some? Why not teach your kid to say, no, thank you? There's nothing wrong with the candy. But Paul said, for the, for the other person's conscience sake, you don't want them to think that by accepting the candy, you somehow also accept the practice by which they got it. So why not teach your kid? So... This is where Halloween gets its association with witchcraft and with magic and with the occult. Now let's bring this home if we can. Home, home, to, home to roost for us. I want to talk to you for a moment about the Christianizing of Sohan. You may be surprised to discover that this thing we call Halloween is very much an invention of the church. More so even than an invention of the pagans. Besides the date, what does Sohan have to really have to do with Halloween? Well, the Druids believed that if you offered a sacrifice to the God of the dead, then he would lessen the punishment for your dead relative. If you appeased him with a sacrifice, and sometimes legend says it might have even been a human sacrifice, if you appeased the God of the dead with a sacrifice, then he might lessen the punishment or treat your dead relative better in the afterlife. Now, this little thing called the Roman Empire happened between about 100 B.C. and about 600 A.D. You all know about the Roman Empire, right? And it did a real good job of absorbing cultures and then spreading the aspects of those culture, uh, cultures across the known world over a period of about 600 years. And so because of that, this whole celebration, this honoring of the dead on October 31st had spread throughout the known world during that time. And by about 607 A.D., along comes the Roman Catholic Church and a guy named Pope Boniface IV. Now, I'm, I don't... I'm not preaching about Catholics. I'm preaching about Halloween. You're with me, right? Okay. So Pope Boniface IV comes along in 607 A.D. And he, he mistakenly believed, as did the leadership of the Catholic Church, they mistakenly believed that if your church got bigger, if the membership was bigger, that meant that the kingdom of God was growing. Now, we don't make that mistake today, do we? They mistakenly believed that if they got more people in the church, that that meant that the kingdom of God was growing. And knowing how much these pagans loved this festival, how much they loved to honor the dead on October the 31st, the Pope had a great idea. He said, I'll tell you what, we will, let's see, honor the dead, but we want them to join the church. I've got an idea. We will declare October 31st to be All Saints Day. And they can still honor the dead. They'll just honor the holy dead instead of the wicked dead. We'll call it All Saints Day or All Hallows Day. Sometimes they call it Hallowmas, like Christmas, the day, of, the day of Christ. Hallowmas was the day of those who were hallowed or the day of the saints. 
So they named October 31st All Saints Day in an attempt to say, hey, pagans, you can have your cake and eat it too. We'll still let you have your little festival honoring the dead as long as you join the church. Now, we don't do that today, do we? We don't water down the gospel. We don't change the doctrine. We don't try to make things a little bit more acceptable and more palatable so that people don't have to change their life but will still join the church. We don't do that, do we? Am I preaching good? So this is exactly what they did. In AD 34, they moved All Saints Day to November 1st, thus making October 31st All Hallows' Eve, from which we get our term, Halloween. So the next thing you know, the church is diving into costumes and trick-or-treat. Do you know that the church would sponsor a parade on this day, and they would parade down the streets with all their parishioners or whatever, and they would dress up like angels and devils? And not only that, but they would encourage the poor and the children among them to do something they called a souling. It's a lot like a wassailing at Christmas time. And they would go from house to house and they would beg for what they called soul cakes. Little treats. Little Tootsie Rolls. And they would go from house to house and they would beg for these soul cakes. And in exchange for the soul cake, they would promise to pray for the souls of their dead relatives. And what the church did is they took, they took Soan, the Lord of the dead, and they threw him away and they put Mary, the mother of God, in his place and said, you can pray to Mary, the mother of God, and you can honor the dead on this day. And this is where the bizarre doctrine, many believe, of purgatory came from. The belief that you could pray somebody out of heaven. And so the children and the poor would go from house to house, a souling, begging for soul cakes, Tootsie Rolls, in the hopes that they could somehow get their relatives into heaven. So, what does the Bible say? Well, we already read to you Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 9. If you would allow me, I'd like to read it to you out of the New Living Translation. I have no idea if Pastor's taking a drink of this or not, but I'm going to take a drink. Oh, that tastes good. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 9. In the New Living Translation, it says this, When you arrive in the land the Lord your God is giving you, be very careful not to imitate the detestable customs of the nations living there. For example, never sacrifice your son or daughter as a burnt offering. And do not let your people practice fortune telling or sorcery or allow them to interpret omens or engage in witchcraft or cast spells or function as mediums or psychics or call forth the spirits of the dead. Anyone who does these things is an object of horror and disgust to the Lord. It is because the other nations have done these things that the Lord your God will drive them out before you or ahead of you. Folks, here's the point I'm trying to make. Everything that Halloween stands for Everything that Halloween espouses, everything that Halloween promotes, everything that Halloween glorifies, from the sacrifice of the dead, or from the sacrifice of, of humans, to the honoring of the dead, to the calling up of dead spirits, to witchcraft, to sorcery, to fortune telling, all of those things, to, to the uh, engaging of activity with evil spirits, to the occultic practices, all of these things are strictly forbidden in the Word of God. Every single thing that Halloween stands for is strictly forbidden in the Word of God. I don't know about you, but I don't see anything debatable here. If you believe the word. Well, what if that's Old Testament, Pastor Jeff, and we all know that the Old Testament has passed away. Oh, wait, read your Bible. You'll find out that Jesus said that's not true. Well, that's fine. Let's look in, let's look in the New Testament. Galatians chapter 5. It says the acts of the sinful nature are obvious. Sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, and witchcraft. And many other things listed there. He says, I warn you as I did before, that those who live like this will not inherit the kingdom of God. Now the Bible is pretty clear. Jesus said, if you engage in witchcraft, if you participate in any of these evil practices, you won't go to heaven. Isn't that what the Bible says? Are you telling me, Pastor Jeff, that if I go trick-or-treating, I'm going to hell? Well, no, but I think you ought to think about it. I think you ought to think about what you're engaging in because the Bible says that witchcraft is the same as all these other detestable practices of the sinful nature. And God said you will not inherit the kingdom of God. Everything associated with Halloween is strictly forbidden in the word of God. Ephesians chapter 5 verse 11 says, Take no part in the worthless deeds, the worthless deeds of evil and darkness. This is what Halloween is all about. It is all about evil and darkness. And young person, old person, every person in between, I want you to hear your youth pastor tell you, the Bible says you are not supposed to take part in the evil practices, the worthless practices of evil and darkness. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 22 and our pastor told us this morning that First Thessalonians is a last day survival manual. 
And what does it say in the survival manual for the last days? It says, abstain from all appearance of evil. Abstain from all appearance of evil. Now let me ask you a question. Next slide. Does this look evil? How about that? How about that? Okay, take that off there for us, Jeremy. There are kids in here. And I just want to show that to you real quick. You know, I showed those pictures on Wednesday night, and the response I got disturbed me a lot. They laughed. They laugh because they've seen worse. And see, here's the problem. Our society has so anesthetized our young people to wickedness and evil and grotesque and the demonic and the occultic that it, nothing phases them anymore. And so if you've got young kids, you ought to pay attention. Because the church of the 7th and the 8th century, they were not supposed to adopt these practices. The early Christian church, they were not supposed to Christianize the wickedness of the Druids. They weren't supposed to do that. But that is exactly what they did. The church was not supposed to sell out the poor and the children among them for a Tootsie Roll. But that's exactly what they did. They sold the soul of a generation for a Tootsie Roll. The church wasn't supposed to compromise the truth for the sake of growing their numbers, and yet that is exactly what they did. You see, a Tootsie Roll is not a big thing. It's short and it's sweet, isn't it? It's just a little treat and it's not worth much. Nobody was willing to give me $100 for a Tootsie Roll. A Tootsie Roll is not, certainly not the kind of thing that's worth your soul. Nobody would sell their soul for a Tootsie Roll. And yet that's what Satan is offering Every one of us. Every day. He's offering us little bitty Tootsie Rolls. Little morsels of evil. Little bitty sweet things that look good and look harmless and look innocent. He's offering them to your teenagers. He's offering them to your children. And He's offering them to you. And He's saying, this little morsel of evil, this little bitty thing, it's short and it's sweet and it sure tastes good and it doesn't last long. It's not going to hurt you. You see the thrills and the chills of that latest horror movie? That's just pretend. It, there's, it's no big deal. It's not going to hurt you. It's just for fun. If you want to go dress up like a vampire or like a ghoul or a goblin or a skeleton, it's just pretend. It's not going to hurt you. It's just for fun. If you want to take your kids and go check out the haunted house, hey, it's fun to be scared. The adrenaline and rush, right? It's no big deal. It's just pretend. I'll tell them afterwards that it's just pretend. Turn over a few tarot cards. Hey, it might be fun to go down to the palm reader down the street and just see what he says. I won't believe it. It's just pretend. It's no big deal. Well, there's one problem with the it's just pretend argument. The evil spirits are real. The evil spirits that you're dealing with, that you're messing around with, are not pretend. And the problem is, is that if you get yourself accustomed enough to pretend evil, when real evil knocks on your door, I fear that you're, it's very unlikely that you'll slam the door in its face. In fact, you might say, hey, that looks cool, come on in. Listen, folks. You know what happens when you eat a Tootsie Roll? It sticks to your teeth. Doesn't it? I'll be perfectly honest with you. I hate these things. They're gross. When you eat a Tootsie Roll, it sticks to your teeth, you know? You eat a couple Tootsie Rolls and your mouth is like this black, brown, slobbery mess, right? You got your finger and you're trying to clean it out, you know? It's awful. And if you eat too many Tootsie Rolls, if somebody came up here and ate this whole bag of Tootsie Rolls and I bet I could get a volunteer... make you sick. And folks, let, let, me, let me bring this home with this. Those little morsels of evil that Satan offers you every single day are just the same way. He comes to you with this little thing and he says, it's just a small thing. Come on, it's, it's, just, it's just one lunch with the secretary. It's no big deal. See, this sermon is not just about Halloween. It's about these little morsels of evil that Satan offers us every day. It's just one little thing. It's just one little movie. It's just one little website. It's just one little thing. And it's sweet and it's short. But you see, you eat enough of those things and they start to stick to you. You allow enough of that evil into your life and it starts to become a part of you. And if you allow enough in, 
It'll ruin your spiritual health. So what's the big deal about Halloween? Nobody would sell their soul for a Tootsie Roll. So let's not sell out the health of our family, the health of our church, the health of our teens, the health of our children, the health of ourselves for things that just aren't worth it. Don't sell your soul for a Tootsie Roll. Josh, would you come and help me for just a moment? We're going to bring this thing to a close. Would you stand with me tonight? I gave you a lot of information tonight, and that's what the message was for. But also what I really would like for you to do tonight is to is to do, just do kind of an inventory of your life. Would you sell your soul for a Tootsie Roll? Mom, Dad? Would you sell your soul? Would you sell your kid's soul for something small, like a few pieces of candy? You see, for some of you parents tonight, this message really is about Halloween. And just like I said to the young people on Wednesday night, for some of you, it really is about, it could really be about occultic practices and witchcraft and evil and darkness and those things that you've allowed to come into your life. Maybe you've done it out of ignorance. Tonight, we've given you the word so that now you can be responsible for it and do the right thing. Aren't you glad you go to a church that doesn't compromise the truth for the sake of numbers? So for some of us tonight, it really is about Halloween. It's really about making a different choice for your family this year. Some of you young adults, young people, maybe even some of you older adults, maybe you just, maybe you've just got some evil, some wicked things in your life that you realize have got a hold on you. You've taken those morsels of evil into your life and they've started to stick. And tonight, you just, you really need to repent and be delivered. For others, these are things that have nothing to do with Halloween. They're just little issues of sin little morsels and you're selling your soul for a Tootsie Roll friend it's not worth it it's not worth it would you bow your heads and close your eyes tonight we're going to pray then I'm going to give you one more challenge we've got other things we need to do tonight so we're not going to make this lengthy but I would just encourage you right there in the quietness of where you are this word is spoken to you tonight and you would say you know what Pastor Jeff I've got some things in my life, some Tootsie Rolls, some things that I've accepted. Now that I've heard the word of God tonight, I want to rid myself of those things. I want to repent of those things. I need to make a change. We're not going to come forward with things like that tonight, but I would like us to acknowledge that and just have a word of prayer if we could. I don't think I'll even look up tonight with every head bowed and every eye closed. If you would just lift a hand towards heaven, if that's you. You know, I've just, for my family, for myself, for my children, I've got some issues in my life, some little Tootsie Rolls. It may have to do with Halloween. It may not, but things I've allowed in my life... I need to repent of those things tonight and just make it right. I don't want to sell my soul for a Tootsie Roll. If that's you tonight, would you just lift your hand towards heaven? And would you keep it lifted? And would you pray sincerely with me for just a moment? Heavenly Father, you see these hands raised tonight. And Lord, in Jesus' name, your word says that the truth that we know will set us free. So God, I pray for every one of these with their hand raised. Lord, as the truth has enlightened their spirit tonight, I pray that you would give them liberty in Jesus' name. I come against every demonic spirit. Lord, your word says that you've been given all authority in all things in heaven and on earth. Everything in the earthly realm and everything in the spiritual realm. And so, God, we take that authority in Jesus' name to drive every evil influence and evil spirit out of these lives tonight in Jesus' name. We come against deception with truth, and truth will always win. We believe it in the name of Jesus. Heavenly Father, I pray that there would be some changes in some families tonight. God, I pray that some parents would go home and throw away the costumes tonight and say we're not going to do that this year. Lord, I pray that some teenagers would make a decision to throw some of the wicked things out of their life. They'd go home and put some video games away. They'd go home and make a decision not to to go out with the buddies to the horror movie this year. Lord, I pray that these things, that you would deeply implant them in our hearts. So that, Lord, we can be holy and acceptable in the last days. So that we can wear that white wedding dress like we saw this morning. I ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. One more challenge I want to give you, and that's this. This message has got a perfectly practical altar call that you can respond to in just a moment. 
Why not? You see, here at Grace Assembly, we're not about just preaching something and then, and then spoiling everybody's fun, right? We want all the kids of this church to have a real good time. I don't want my kids growing up thinking, okay, being a Christian means you never get to have any fun because the church just tells you all the stuff you can't do and then they never give you anything besides that. So we are having one of the coolest things in the world at this church tomorrow night. And you know what? My kids don't miss Halloween because they're like, why would I want to dress up and go door to door? I can go to the church and get more candy than I'll ever eat. Amen? So here's a practical altar call for you. They need lots of help with the fall festival. Maybe you were planning on taking your kids trick-or-treating. I gave you the word of God. I challenge you to make a different decision. I challenge you to make a different decision. Bring your kids, bring yourself, bring your neighbor kids, all those other kids that would come to your house and trick or treat. I challenge you to turn the porch light off, bring all those kids to church tomorrow night. Is that good preaching? That's the altar call tonight. There's going to be a meeting in the choir room for everybody that wants to help. I'm sure that they will still let you help even if you didn't put your name on the list. Am I right about that? I challenge you to do that, to make a practical response to tonight's message. Thank you so much for listening tonight. God bless you. Praise the Lord. I thank God for Pastor Jeff. Uh, he is... Go ahead. Amen. Definitely one of the best preachers that we know. Definitely one of the smartest youth pastors I've ever seen. But we thank God that our teenagers hear this. And uh, we're going to make sure this is on the website first thing tomorrow. I'm getting a thumbs up from the back there. Because a lot of you will want to tell people about that and uh, uh, follow the direction. The scripture says in 2 Corinthians chapter 6 what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness and what communion has light with darkness what part has a believer with an unbeliever and what agreement has the temple of God with idols for you are the temple of the living God so come out from among them and be separate and do not touch what is unclean and the most important line comes next and I will receive you it's no, it shouldn't be any shock to us that in these last days that Halloween is such a big deal because the dichotomy of the last days means that the world is getting darker and darker. But the good news is that the church is getting stronger and stronger. Walking the fence, straddling the, walking the line and straddling the fence, not an option anymore. God and, God and the world are demanding that we make a choice. So my challenge, along with Pastor Jeff, let's choose righteousness. Let's choose purity. Let's choose holiness. Because we'd whole lot rather have the rewards of those things than what the Word of God says about these other things. Amen?